We've got a People's Choice Award coming up next, so I think he deserves a little bit of extra love for that performance. That was great. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so, you know, the, the elephant in the room in the healthcare technology sphere is really what's happened over the last two years. Digital solutions, remote patient monitoring, new ways to access the healthcare system. It's been really rapidly scaled over the last two years. So I want to get kind of your insights on how maybe those the role of technology has improved healthcare accessibility and maybe bridged some of the healthcare inequity gaps. And maybe Bill, I'll start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, and great job, everybody, on your presentations. Um, and so, as you all would have heard from my talk, one of the key focuses at Rocket Doctor was exactly that question. So. How do you leverage advanced technology to um, not just recreate an in-person experience to sort of satisfy healthcare access during the pandemic, but actually improve healthcare and then give access to populations that traditionally haven't had it before? And so what's really neat is we've done postal code analyses of Rocket Doctor and have seen that because we're based on provincially funded health insurance, more than 50% of folks that use us are from rural and northern communities. And so you can now be in the far north and you can access the most competent physician in downtown Calgary or Edmonton. Um, and so you don't have to drive hours or have a flight or wait at an academic referral hospital. So I think digital health and then looping in remote patient monitoring, advanced devices um, is gonna finally really break down the barriers to accessibility for all Canadians, I hope. Yeah, awesome, you guys are uh, reaching the far corners of the, uh, the country here for sure. Uh, how about yourself, Jana, with, with True Angle? love to just build on what you said, Bill. I think that, um, you know, even within urban centers, I know that one of the things actually that was the impetus for looking at a solution for uh, dysphagia was that I'd started a clinical trial where I wanted patients to come in for this intensive therapy. So it has to be intensive for, for us to make lasting changes. And um, started this trial, and after about a year, I think I had two people who enrolled simply because it was just unrealistic to expect people who are in their 50s or 60s who are working to be able to come to a hospital and do all that kind of stuff. So I, I think that I totally agree. It, it, it um, increases access to our, our um, people who are not within a, a city, but it also increases access for folks who are in a city and maybe even if it's not work, they can't get there because of mobility issues or whatever it might be. So, um, I, and I think for a lot of chronic conditions that cost our healthcare system so much money, um, these things are going to be solutions for addressing that. Awesome, thanks. And Jeff, in your in your practice or in your journey with RAF so far, I mean, how have you seen um, you know the, the solutions being implemented start to maybe improve accessibility to some of these patients that never had these kinds of tools before? Yeah, I mean, yeah, especially my clinical life as a physiatrist, we're, we're very rare birds. It's hard to find a physiatrist. So giving people the opportunity to get into the building, and whether that's digitally or in person, by using tools that, like you mentioned, enable long distance healthcare, or, or just, you know, something that's simple and accessible that allows someone to tell their own story. I think it really helps patients get the care they need, which previously, you know, it was a barrier. Like I, a really simple story, the hospital I work at down in South Calgary, we work with disabled individuals and the doors are not automatic. So I have patients that roll up in their wheelchair and get stuck the, the, the five meters they need to get to me, they get stuck at that five meter point. And so just having a simple digital tool really helps patients that might not have disabilities that you recognize get the care that they need. Serena, with ShareSmart scaling over the last few years, where have you seen you know, the most sort of interesting application in, in really reaching groups that you might not have reached before? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think, um, again, you know, it's been very interesting for telehealth players because I think we played a huge role in um, maintaining accessibility levels throughout the pandemic. You know, the stats say, um, telemedicine visits um, grew by over 4,000% over the last two years, which is really great. But I think the most interesting um, opportunities, at least for us, has been the opportunity to flip legacy um, models upside down. Um, for example, we're working with a, um, a workers union based in New York City where, you know, using union dues, they set up physical clinics, man with physical primary care docs, and specialists. And before the pandemic, everything worked well. Um, workers could come in, 
see their doctor and go back to work. But once the pandemic hit, people were either sick or worried sick, and they weren't accessing these physical facilities anymore. And so working with groups like them, we virtualized a lot of their offerings, um, facilitating telemedicine visits, connecting primary care physicians with specialists, making, you know, taking things online um, to help those who might be immunocompromised or who don't have that many sick days to take off. And um, I think that brings hope Awesome, thank you. So Thayer, with Managing Life, you guys are really developing a new model for, for chronic, chronic pain management in the clinic. So I'm curious to know your, your sort of perspective on you know, reaching patients with this digital platform that may not have had kind of any access to any sort of um, environment to collect their symptoms. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, I think the gold standard for chronic pain management is something called a multidisciplinary pain treatment center where it combines physiatry, it combines anesthesiology, rehab, um, self-management, psychology under one roof. But there's only one for every 300,000 Canadians, and 90% of them are located in urban centers. So it's just not feasible to actually offer that type of care to all Canadians. And so um, we were exploring a model where, as part of our uh, multi-site validation study led by UHN, we had two urban academic hospitals, but we also included Iroquois Falls Family Health Team. So Iroquois Falls is a tiny town of 4,500, 11 hours north of Toronto. Uh, they're the only clinic in like a three hour catchment area and they service a large number of First Nation reserves. And what was really, really surprising for us was that out of the three sites, that was the site that engaged with our platform the most. Um, almost double the amount of usage from their patient group. 95% like of people used it regularly. And that just goes to show that there's a real need for populations that aren't really served with specialty care. And I think that's a big opportunity for digital health. Yeah, awesome, awesome stuff. So next one, maybe I'll uh, direct this one to you, uh, Jeff, to, to start us off. So whether it's you know a, a, a digital tool for a clinician to use in the clinic or something at home for the patients to use on a regular basis, you know the biggest challenge to success and implementation is adoption and adherence. So when you're designing these products early on, how do you sort of keep this in mind in this sort of, how do you address the adherence gap in the design of the products? Yeah, I mean, it's a really tough problem. And I think the way we've conceptualized it is at every point in the patient journey, you have to think, what is the friction point? What's gonna get them to stop using it, turn off the device, switch to something else, identify what that friction is, and make it seamless. Get some oil into the gears so that it flows, so that it's not hard to do, so that it's something that works with the life that they already have. Uh, and I love examples like wearables like Fitbit and Garmin watches because they just, they just work. You slap them on, they, they monitor your data, and then eventually they output it. And that not every solution has an opportunity to do something that seamless, but I think that should be the goal. Identify your friction points, make it nice and smooth so that patients don't even notice that they're using your device or tool. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Maybe, Jana, if you have anything to, to add to that with you know, um, your device and platform being used in the home by patients. Yeah, for sure. I think one of the most important things around um, product design is actually process design. And um, without that, it, there's you. It, it comes down to what you were saying too, Jeff, but from the first start as getting buy-in from clinicians. So you have to think about, you know, just throwing technologies at systems and they're not ready for it or they don't know how to integrate it or they're doing something this way, so why should they change? So the key there is change management. And as something, as a, you know, an entrepreneur, when you're first developing your product, the last thing you're thinking about is change management. But I tell you, when you hit the market and you're trying to understand um, your product uh, market fit, that becomes so important. So understanding those processes, and not every center is going to be the same. So you have to have a flexible process as well. But there's a lot to be said about design um, and even design and sales as well, right? Yeah, yeah, well put. Uh, so, Thayer, where have you seen sort of some, you know, some successful tactics when you are, you know, designing your platform for patient use to, you know, keep them regularly using the, the application and regularly interacting with the, uh, the platform? So, uh, it's interesting. I, I know you had mentioned that, uh, you know, understanding the physician's need or the clinical need and integrating to the process, which is very important. Uh, we took a very different approach. I didn't talk to any clinicians or academics or researchers for four years. Uh, and the reason for that is because I wanted to find out what people with pain actually needed. 
And so we spent a lot of time interviewing our users and building features and functionalities that gave them what they needed. And through our research and conversations, the overwhelming motivating factor for people with pain that we found was validation. Can we give people a tool that gave them a voice when they did talk to their doctor because they weren't being believed? And then once we built around that, we got usage, um, and then we leveraged the data that we captured to integrate into the clinical workflow to support decision making. Awesome, thanks. So maybe a couple quick responses from from Bill and Rena from the uh, sort of the uh, um, sort of the, the tool side of things and you being used by physicians and sort of the healthcare system. I mean, how do you ensure that the product is going to be adopted seamlessly by your end users? Yeah, I loved what you said just there because I think really that is the key that people aren't stupid and so patients and providers and if something is clearly offers some sort of clinical value then they're going to use it and they're going to recommend it to their patients and ultimately as a physician you're know, building that trust with the patient telling them that hey this is going to actually help your clinical care I think is the most powerful motivator and then never underestimating how difficult it is for a patient to use technology. And so, you know, building for us a system of care with allied healthcare providers to actually walk folks through how to use complex devices that maybe we think are not that hard, but um, actually are. And so making sure it's effective. Awesome, thanks, Bill. Rena, last, uh, last sort of word is yours for this topic. Yeah, for sure. I think our company takes a approach um, that is a blend of the approach taken by all these speakers here. Um, but the piece I think um, that's been working for us is um, data-driven agile development. So along you know, the development continuum from inception to re release to refinement, we're, we're revisiting these numbers continuously to understand you know, what feature sets people are using and you know, um, coming back to over and over again where are people dropping off, like that friction piece. Um, if someone is logging off consistently at a certain point in the, in the um, solution, you know, it gives us a hint as to what's not working. And so um, that's how we design for um, stakeholder-informed, um, highly adherent uh, solutions. Awesome, I love it. Well, thanks so much for uh, all your opinions and expertise and for the great pitches today. So be sure to visit them in the networking room later today. And uh, I think we're just about moving into lunch, so I'll pass it back to, to you, Kate.